Over the last few lessons, we've been talking about surface forces and contact mechanics. And I haven't explicitly stated this, but we've assumed that the density of the tip and the density of the samples are uniform, meaning there are no atoms, there are no nuclei, there are no electrons. Everything is just uniform density everywhere. There's an old word to refer to this. Uh, I think it's a, a fun word. It's called jellium, meaning that it's jello everywhere, same density. Now, that's a fine assumption for macroscopically sized objects and micron sized objects, but when we we're getting down to the nanometer scale, where angstroms are just sub nanometer, maybe it's not such a good assumption. So let's re-examine that. Let's think about considering in our modeling to model the tip in the sample as collections of atoms. So the first question you might have is, is the atom a particle or a wave? You might have heard this term, wave-particle duality, and what that means is in quantum mechanics, sometimes atoms and electrons and protons behave as waves, and sometimes they behave as particles. So the question is, which way do atoms behave for our experiments? A convenient criterion for answering the question of whether an atom is a particle or a wave is to say, is that wavelength less than or greater than the diameter of that atom? Now, in quantum mechanics, you can express the wavelength of something as Planck's constant over the mass times the speed of that something. Well, Planck's constant is equal to 6.26 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Mass, that's straightforward. What about the speed v? What is the speed of an atom that's just sitting there? It's actually not stationary. It jiggles back and forth because of thermal energy. There's an expression called the equal partition theorem that relates thermal energy to kinetic energy, one half mv squared, and we'll, when we're thinking about a collection of particles, we call it the mean square velocity, or the mean square speed. And while we're here writing this idea, we'll also write down that it's also equal to one half the or the spring potential uh, squared, where k is stiffness and, and x is the deflection or extension of a spring. So what we can do is we can solve this equation for speed, which is the root mean square velocity, and looking at the equation immediately above, that is equal to Boltzmann's constant times temperature in Kelvin divided by mass, the whole thing square root. I haven't defined Boltzmann's constant. It is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per degree Kelvin. Let's repeat that expression for wavelength. By the way, this is called the de Broglie wavelength after the gentleman who postulated it in 1924. And at the time, it was just a wild hypothesis, but it's turned out to, to work very well. So if you have a crazy idea sometime, take heart. It might work out. So we end up with this expression that the de Broglie wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by the quantity mass, Boltzmann's constant temperature. 
and I'm going to be using temperature is equal to 293 degrees Kelvin that's room temperature during these calculations I'm going to show you these examples now let's take the electron and I'm going to let you put in the numbers but the de Broglie wavelength of an electron is 10.9 nanometers now that is huge for the atomic scale. It's particularly huge for an electron that's supposed to be a point particle, although no one really knows. So there's no question that an electron is a wave. And in fact, scanning tunneling microscopy depends on electrons being waves, because those waves leak out of surfaces, and when the tip is close to the sample, those waves overlap, and that's when you get the tunneling current. Now how about hydrogen? You put in the numbers for hydrogen, and you get 0.26 nanometers for the wavelength, and its diameter is pretty close to 0.1 nanometers. So our criterion of if the wavelength is bigger than the diameter means that hydrogen is a wave as well. What about helium? Helium we can do the calculation in our head because we know that helium is about four times bigger and more massive than hydrogen. So four times more massive, it's in a square root in the, in the denominator so that means the wavelength is half that of hydrogen. Now the diameter of helium is bigger than hydrogen. It's about 0 0.28 nanometers. And so now clearly hydrogen or helium is a particle at room temperature, as is all, all as are all of the other elements in the periodic table that are more massive than helium. Now that we've established that atoms of most elements behave as particles at room temperature, let's go back to the Leonard Jones potential that I introduced in lesson 25. Leonard Jones potential is a good approximation for the interaction between two atoms it's got a repulsive part, an attractive part, an equilibrium at position R0, and the depth of the well is U0 in the minus direction. So if we think about an atom, and I told you that you can think these potential diagrams are really useful because you can think of balls rolling in valleys. I think we did that in lesson 19 or 20 or so. So let's put our atom at equilibrium and it, this potential is due to the presence of a nearby atom. And now, because of thermal energy, the equation I wrote at the beginning of this, this lesson, we said that thermal energy is equal to kinetic energy, which in turn is equal to potential energy. So the thermal energy makes the atom sit back, sit in and it's oscillating and jiggling around its equilibrium position. And the amount that it goes up the sides of the valley depends on the thermal energy. So maybe up to this level, where this distance here is equal to the thermal energy. Now, so when the atom is at the equilibrium position at the bottom, that thermal energy is all kinetic and when it's up at these turning points where thermal is equal to potential energy then it's all all potential and energy is exchanged between kinetic and potential as the atom jiggles back and forth an interesting question is how far does it jiggle and I will call this distance delta R, the distance away from equilibrium. And if we square that and take the mean and take the square root,
that is the root mean square delta r. So let's calculate that now. That's interesting, and we can do a little computer experiment related to that. Okay, we are after delta r. We're going to use the equal partition theorem, which states that thermal energy is equal to ki kinetic energy, and in this particular case, we also want to use the term that it's equal to potential energy. And that's the spring stiffness, and now mean square delta r. And we need to look at what that spring constant is for the Leonard Jones potential. If you remember back when we were talking about potentials, I said that the spring constant is the second derivative of the potential evaluated at the equilibrium position. A good homework problem is to show that for the Leonard Jones potential, it's equal to 72 u0 over r0 squared. Now using that, we take the first equation, we cancel the one-halves, and then we solve it for delta r. It's the square root of the mean square delta r. And so this becomes the square root of Boltzmann's constant times temperature divided by the spring constant. And now we substitute in the value for the spring constant. We get r0 squared here and 72 u0 here. Okay, so that is delta r, which we might informally call jiggle distance. Let's see what that looks like. To show you how atoms jiggle around in a potential well, depending on the temperature, I made a computer lab. Here's a screenshot from it. And what we have are a bunch of dots, a hundred of them, showing where an atom is as it's jiggling back and forth. So it's like I've taken a snapshot and then overlaid 100 snapshots. Here's another one. Same conditions, but you see that particular positions have changed. If we want to measure delta r, we're going to have to make more snapshots. In this one, I've increased the count from 100 to 1,000, and you see these little cursors here and here. They're measuring the diameter of what we would call a trap. And that diameter is about 40 picometers. If we run the program again, this time with a temperature that's about a quarter of the starting temperature, of 900 Kelvin, you see that the diameter of the trap has gone down. It's gone down by a factor of two. And that's exactly what we expect. We said that delta R is equal to the square root of Boltzmann's constant times temperature times the equilibrium distance squared divided by 72 u0. In summary, we've been looking at whether atoms should be considered waves or particles. We found that all elements except for hydrogen are particles, and even hydrogen isn't too far off. That is useful because we can think about atoms then as being balls rolling back and forth in potential wells due to thermal energy. We can see how far they move when we do computer simulations as over here where several snapshots have been taken of an atom's position over time. We'll be applying these ideas in the next lesson on molecular dynamics where we take a look at 
the atoms in tips interacting with samples.